Richard Cordray and Jerry Springer, will they or won't they run for governor? Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Joe Ingalls, State House reporter for Ohio Public Radio, Herb Asher, OSU political scientist, and Terry Casey, Republican strategist. Can you really have a deadline if it is based on speculation? As oxymoronic as it sounds, speculation was that we'd know by Labor Day if Richard Cordray was going to run for governor. To do so, the Democrat would have to quit his job as the head of the Federal Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Republicans in Washington want him to make a decision, perhaps so they can reduce the power of the bureau put in place after the banking and foreclosure crisis. Democrats in Ohio want him to make a decision so they can try to get behind a candidate. Herb Asher, what's your thinking right now? Is Cordray going to run or not? I don't know. <laughs> and the question is, does he know? Yeah. And I think there is a deadline, and the deadline really is partly generated by the media focus on will he or won't he. And if he keeps on waiting and then eventually does, the frame will be, this was the reluctant candidate. And that's not a very good frame if you want to run for office. So I think he has another week or two. And then if it's much later than that, you'll, everybody will continue saying, well, is he going to do it? Isn't he going to do it? And if he does jump in, people will say, well, why didn't he do it sooner? We're six months before the filing deadline. Yeah. Now. It's really early. Of course it's early. But, and so, for example, I think there's more pressure on Cordray to announce uh, soon than there is on Jerry Springer because nobody's been talking for a long period of time about will Jerry or won't Jerry do it. So Jerry Springer can take a little longer. Now, there's a practical thing here, too. The longer you wait, the, the more there are going to be people out there who are going to feel, well, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to commit to other candidates. Uh, if you enter very, very late, then, in fact, it's going to look a little arrogant because these other candidates have been out there. Uh, I think there's a debate coming up in the not-too-distant future, and you, if you haven't declared, you're not going to be in that debate. So I think there's more pressure on Cordray to make a decision. But there's one group that doesn't want him to make the decision to run, and that's Ohio Republicans. Washington Republicans may have a little different view. So but do I, do you well, want to run? I disagree with Herb. He's definitely going to run. If you read certain tea leaves and yeah, little yeah. details, he's definitely running. This is all part of the spin of the guy being drafted to run. And of course, his real complaint was Donald Trump didn't fire him and make him a martyr the way the FBI director was. But it's going to play out in September. Today, the New York Times did a big puff piece on him and his agency, yeah. but he's going to announce it's just good to get a lot of this speculation and coverage before he officially announces. He's, 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 that, that New York Times report talked about how many of the consumer protection policies that they've put in place are actually popular in places like Kentucky and rural America, the people who vote for Donald Trump. It really was a puff it, it was, piece. It was a softer how, piece. How wonderful was, he yeah. is and but, all that. But Ohio Republicans have in fact been encouraging through RNC and then to the White House do not fire him now. Maybe, in fact, he might leave after the filing deadline, but do not make him a martyr. Right. The key thing is they don't want him to be a martyr. Yep. Uh, but he's going to run. And don't forget Richard Cordray in his congressional race, and I think he's four or five statewide races, he's never beat a named Republican mm. with any money or resources. Mm. So he's not done that well statewide as a candidate. So, Joe, are Democrats getting itchy? They want they want him to either say yes or no, uh, I'm in, so they can raise money and the unions can get behind one of the other candidates, things like that? Well, if you'd ask him that on tape for a soundbite, they'd tell you no, no, they've got great candidates, they're proud of what they have. But inside, you have to think that they have to be uh, worried about those things because it takes a, a tremendous amount of money right now to run for statewide office and especially for governor. And uh, when you have candidates right now uh, at least the ones that have been named, uh, they don't have any name recognition statewide. So you're, you're dealing with that as well, and that takes even more money. And a lot of Democrat women will tell you they're not happy with some of the boys in the labor unions who pick people like Fitzgerald and telling Betty Sutton, a former member of Congress, she's running, and I think she's going to stay in it. And she's got a lot of labor and some name ID and a base up in northeastern Ohio. And in case Democrats haven't noticed, 54% or maybe much as 60% of the Democrat primary vote will be women, and they feel they've been neglected, they haven't had their chance. Joe, Jerry Springer does have that name recognition, the t controversial TV host, former mayor of Cincinnati, former candidate for governor. What are the odds, 
I don't want you to go into lay odds, but a, a speculation that he is going to, to jump into this race. There's more and more talk. He's at a Labor Day event this weekend. Uh, he's sure acting and sounding like a candidate these days. I'm telling you, being up there with labor unions in Cleveland on Labor Day, uh, fighting for a $15 minimum wage in Cleveland, uh, that looks like someone who wants to run for governor. And, and he's very connected. You've got to remember that uh, you know, it, he's always been connected, even since, you know, he's been in his TV show for 27 years. But during that time, he's funded Ohio candidates. He's remained involved with the Ohio Democratic Party. He has uh, run for statewide office and failed before, but he has the name recognition. The thing he's going to have to worry about is overcoming a television show that a lot of people, mm. uh, especially Democrats, don't like. Is he yeah. testing the waters, Herb, or is he well, really considering running? Oh, I think he's considering. Yeah. And... Uh, and I think he's a more credible candidate than people would think at this stage. And the TV show is certainly a liability in some ways, but in other ways it actually sort of captures the popular culture of today, un unfortunately, or whatever. And he's a very smart guy. He knows the issues. He's also a guy who can relate to citizens. One of the questions about Richard Cordray, everybody says he is a superb public servant, and he is. Outstanding person of integrity and intelligence. How well does he relate? And so if he does run, can he take his experiences from the consumer protection activity instead of, and instead of talking about it from a very legalistic perspective, talk about it, you know, when we worked on this issue, we helped families in Ohio. To, Jerry Springer can do that right off the side. And I want to defend Jerry Springer in part because if he looks at a lot of voters, particularly Democrats, totally mm. forgave Bill Clinton yeah. for the things he did, and they look at Donald Trump, they look at TV, reality TV, yeah. the Kardashians, and Trump, and a lot of people view that that's no longer a hindrance. What yeah. would have been fatal exactly. 30 years ago is not today. Exactly. And if you're, if you're all you know of Jerry Springer is, you know, the, the crazy TV show, you hear him speak, and he does speak very well on policy issues, you're going to say, whoa. That's yeah. pretty good. The bar is pretty low right now for Jerry Springer. But there is that little point when he was mayor of Cincinnati, he not only wrote a check to the prostitute in northern Kentucky, but then the check bounced and she wasn't happy. So he, I think he's so, learned from his mistakes. So many years ago. Yeah, I was going to say and again, how many decades ago Yes, was that? and again, I mean, you, you know, you're right. In this era, though, the ground rules have changed, and Donald Trump has contributed mightily to that, but the broader culture has contributed to that also. Right. It's a different world. It really is. In the race for U.S. Senate on the Republican side, it's a race to the right, a race to get on the right side of Donald Trump and his supporters. Josh Mandel is, of course, the favorite. He's been channeling the president for months, railing against illegal immigration and what he and the president call radical Islam. Now his primary opponent, Mike Gibbons, is making a play for the Trump vote. North Korea launches long-range missiles. ISIS bombs innocent children at a concert. Obamacare is imploding, and opioids are killing kids. Yet the liberals and knuckleheads at CNN are obsessed with destroying our president by using fake news. That's a disgrace. I'm running for Senate to stand up for Ohio families, and I'll work hard with Donald Trump to pass a conservative agenda. Terry Casey's even got the red tie of Donald Trump. I mean, he hit all the high points, North Korea, radical Islam, fake news. It's Donald Trump right there. No, he's not Donald Trump because he suffers for a little thing. You can see it on TV. It's what I call boring white male syndrome. This guy is totally forgettable. And five minutes after this segment, how many of your viewers can even remember the guy's name? He's not going to go anywhere. And I think it's the big thing to watch in this race is Sherrod is definitely scared because he doesn't have the presidential turnout model he had in 2012. It's going to be a gubernatorial model turnout year, which is different. And also the whole anti-incumbent, anti-DC beltway thing, that's something that Sherrod's going to have to deal with. So I'm not saying Josh is guaranteed to win, but there's some advantages that Josh has this year he didn't have six years ago. But Joe, he's, this Mike Gibbons here, he's, he's appeals to um, sort of establishment Republicans who don't like Josh Mandel. Right. He's woefully underfunded compared to Mandel, and it doesn't have the name recognition, but right. he, he's making noise anyway. Right, and he's a businessman. He'll be able to throw some money into his own campaign, but of course he won't have the fundraising prowess that Mandel has. The other thing is, uh, if you listen to Mike Gibbons, what he talks about a lot is being the adult in the room. And every time Mandel has a misstep in the media, he'll he'll be running in there and, and you know, 
but I'm, you know, the adult. I, I, I've, I've been around. I've, I've had the business. I know how to do this. I know how to pay the bills and the taxes and deal with this stuff. And uh, so that's, that's where he's going to go with this, with his campaign. Is that? But it's not easy for him to out Mandel, Mandel. Right. Yeah. What about this, Josh Mandel, really doubling down on Donald Trump? I, he is popular among Ohio Republicans. Yeah. But he's at 33, 34 percent, depending on the poll among everybody. So but among Republicans, depends. Trump does much better. And yeah. I've seen some polling yeah. in the last week or so. Trump, if there was a rematch of Kasich versus Trump, Trump would win big. In the over, Republican side. Right. And that's what it's all about, a Republican yeah, primary. Yeah. But you'd think at this stage, Mandel is, let's say, overwhelmingly favored to win the primary. So how far to the right do you move? And then try to move a little bit back in the general election and be credible. And I think Sherrod Brown is really happy to see Mandel go further and further and further to the right. And one of the things for Sherrod is, at least on certain issues, including uh, issues of jobs and economic fairness and trade policy and things like that, Sherrod is the one Democrat who, who can say, actually, I was there before Donald Trump ever got there. And that's going to be a very important statement to make. Yeah, I mean, he's, uh, uh, Josh Mandel's not going to win Democratic precincts in Youngstown. Sherrod Brown's going to beat him up there. It's not going to be close to like Trump well, made it with but, Hillary. But, but part of it depends on some of those voters who voted for Trump who were Democrats. Mm -hmm. Do they want to change and feel that the swamp needs to be drained in D.C.? Because Sherrod is like from his, I mean, he's literally, I think since age 21, been in politics virtually the whole yeah, time. Yeah. So in some and, ways, he's epitomizes that incumbent and, and everything you don't like about D.C. And my sense actually is that it's, that's not the case. They, they do not see Sherrod Brown in that category. He's been somebody who's consistently been fighting for them. He's been on message for a long time. He's been around for a long time, but they do not see him as part of the swamp. He, in part, has been fighting the swamp. And so he was actually there again before but Trump was there. But then the argument comes up, well, if you've been fighting the swamp and you've been at it for decades, why haven't you done anything? Well, we can tell you why in the last couple of years it's been difficult. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to our next topic. Governor Kasich and his Democratic counterpart in Colorado have released details of their plan to fix Obamacare. And it looks a lot like Obamacare. Kasich and Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper's plan would basically continue parts of Obamacare for a couple more years. The plan would keep the mandate that all people buy insurance. That's to keep young, healthy people in the insurance pool. It would keep federal subsidies, federal help, so low-income people can buy insurance and not face steep premium hikes. It would create a fund for states to stabilize their insurance markets, and it would give states some flexibility on what they consider essential benefits. The governors say their plan stabilizes the insurance market and promotes innovation. So think of it this way. We have the car is in the ditch, and we need to get it out of the ditch and stabilize the situation, which is exactly what we do here. But secondly, we then give states the ability to bring any type of innovation they want, as long as they're not dropping coverage for people and as long as the coverage is going to be reasonable, where people are going to have comprehensive coverage. Jim Eagles, what, well, what do you, what's the goal of this plan? Is it to have bipartisanship like you saw there, two governors, different parties together, working together, or is it to really reform health care? Well, I think there's a little bit of both. Uh, the car in the ditch analogy that you just I haven't used. heard that before. Oh, man, we <laughs> never heard that, have we? Uh, I, I think, you know, the big, the big thing is that in states that have the uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, their their economy depends on it, and their their health care systems really depend on keeping it. Here in Ohio, we have uh, hospitals in some counties that say if that wasn't in place, they'd go under. Um, there's a real issue here, and because there's not a substantive kind of debate about it right now in Washington, uh, this is getting a lot of traction. But if you look at the plan, it's a lot of the things that Governor Kasich's been saying all along. And I'm sure that, you know, uh, Governor Hickenlooper probably is saying some of these things too in his state. It's more of an, of an effect that they have this, this plan in place in the states, and they've got to make it work. So what will make it work? It's all these things they're talking about, but it didn't go over well before, and will it go over again? I don't know. Terry, is this just Obamacare and Obamacare extension until they figure it out? Maybe when I looked at the thing, it was billed as a menu. 
Well, normally when you go into Bob Evans or some other place on the menu, it shows the price. And nowhere, especially from somebody who was a real budget hawk who looked at those things, did it tell you what each of those items would cost. And then most importantly, like when you get done in a grocery store, you got to do the checkout and then they ask for you to pay for it. There was no indication other than getting more young people to buy overpriced insurance that they don't feel is a good value. How do we pay for it? So they're all good sounding things, but on this menu, there's no price tag and no clarity on who's going to pick up the tab. Whose credit card does all this go on? Herb, it does identify the things in Obamacare that kind of need fixing right now. The, the yeah. insurance market is pretty in, unstable. Stable. People are facing 20, 25% premium hikes if you're on mm -hmm. the exchange. These, uh, with no details, but it does get those, yeah, those no, look, issues. Look, the first thing, contribution it makes, is that we actually finally have a bipartisan discussion going forward. That's important. It probably now will encourage those in the U.S. Senate who want to have that kind of discussion to move forward or whatever, because everybody agrees there needs to be changes, repairs, whatever, and everybody, not everybody, most people agree there's not going to be a Democratic solution and there's not going to be a Republican solution. So what they've done is they've moved the discussion forward and that's much better than what the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate have really done, if you believe in covering people. Is Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell, are they going to take this plan to the, to, the, to the caucuses and vote on it? I don't think so. And the other thing that was totally missing in there that was missing in Obamacare, has mm -hmm. been missing in the Republican plans, is how do we make health care more affordable? Because that's the number one thing. Just calling an act affordable care didn't do anything to drive down costs at the hospital, costs with doctors, costs on x-rays and processes. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's, that's a key point here because, you know, when people talk about the cost, you, you know, some people like to blame the patient. <laughs> Don't get sick. You're driving. No, no. Think about the hospitals. Think about the insurance companies. Think about the pharmaceutical companies. Think about the medical device manufacturers. Think about all those people and industries that are actually... Uh, contributing to this, but that's difficult for both parties to touch, especially uh, Big Pharma on the Republican side, but the medical device side, you have Democrats wanting to eliminate the taxes on the medical device providers or whatever, and that's the that's the part of the story that's not really being uh, uh, discussed. A lot of New Jersey Democrats yeah. favor pharmaceutical companies or get donations from And companies. Minnesota Democrats yeah. also, and me medical sure. devices. There is one thing there that is kind of, it gives states more flexibility on what in a set, what has to be covered. Basically means you don't have to cover everything under Obamacare, right. so something's not going to get covered, right. whether it be birth control or right. pregnancy for, if you're 65, you don't have to cover, pay for, you know, prenatal care. Yeah. That's contra that was controversial when they were talking about it in the House and Senate. It was, and uh, it will be controversial if they pick this up and talk about it uh, in the future. But I, I just honestly think that this is a lot of what they've already rehashed. And like Herb says, I think they're going to take this and go forward, and they're going to work on it. This is just, you know, a plan that's here today, and it's a starting point, but it will not be what they... You, and the state flexibility, I think, is very important because in Ohio with Medicaid, Governor Kasich has done a lot to basically say, instead of just paying for each procedure, we want to pay for success yeah. in helping people get well, because too many doctors, too many hospitals, just look at every billing procedure and every button yeah. they can so push. Who, who decides if a procedure was a, a success? Uh, I'm not sure how they do it, but in Ohio they've been yeah. doing some yeah. of that and it's paid off. O Ohio. And Ohio's rate of growth in Medicaid is much lower than what yeah. it's been historically. Yeah, Terry's right. Ohio the governor, the governor's two people most in charge of Medicaid, they actually have done a good job. And actually that should be replicated across the nation if other states decide to go that way. So I think actually the governor has a lot more credibility about talking about how do you make Medicaid a more effective and more efficient thing. Now, what they're talking about, I can't imagine this ever getting through a U.S. House unless you, but I can see it getting through a Senate and on the U.S. House, it would have to get through with probably 30 or 40 Republican votes and all the Democrats, and that might be the end of the speakership well, for deadlines. Paul Ryan. They do put deadlines. I think 2018, yeah, yeah. 20, well, 2019, 2020, yeah. was that enough to get conservatives to say, okay, Obamacare will end as we know it in 2019 or 2020? Is that Well, part of it, see, Congress has been looking the other way because the courts have kind of said the subsidies given to insurance companies to cover their losses 
that that's really not authorized and appropriated money. We're getting mm. fairly technical here, mm. but part of what's in this proposal is kind of making legal what they've kind of been doing indirectly uh, in these subsidies because part of the reason why insurers don't want to cover people in some counties is mm. they don't get enough revenue out of there to cover all the costs. All right, let's get to our last topic. Ohio State is full of traditions, but a funny and sometimes provocative tradition has ended just as it began. Last year, the opening of new dorms with big windows brought out students' creativity. They used signs, flags, posters, and sticky notes to promote their causes, whether it be a marriage proposal or support for the fallen Cincinnati gorilla with the message you read there, ducks out for Harambe. This year, OSU said no more window messages, but with very little explanation. We and many other colleges have a policy that says that uh, the windows are made to be windows and need to be used as such. And uh, so, I mean, I, I could look more carefully into the discussions that took place, but it seemed like a reasonable thing to do. At the State House, two Republicans have introduced a bill that would prohibit public college campuses from measures that would chill free expression. Herb Asher, and, and that's wants more sunlight. Yeah, is that, and, is that and, a good enough explanation? And <laughs> what's motivating the legislators downtown is not that issue. It's really the issue of speakers on yes. campus. But, and I think you could tell by, uh, you know, President Drake's sort of chuckling. He's probably thinking, you know, who the hell came up with this idea? <laughs> that doesn't seem like he's, he's committed to it with any great passion or whatever. But it, it, it's one of those things, though, that when you link it to the issue of speakers on campus and other and then some of the events that are happening out in California on campuses or whatever that helps sort of de, um, raise this broader question of well what is the status of free speech on campus now the window thing you know I would be curious if students kept on putting things in the windows what would be enforced there well, I, and then tell faculty member to make sure what they have what they have in their office on their walls because while it's not public in, in terms of the outside of the building you know, people come into faculty members' offices and... Uh, and they, they say you can put anything you want on the wall of your dorm, but you just can't put it in the window where other people can see. I think they're worried about, Terry, you know, you Nazi, mean, you, Nazi flags or, you know, Confederate flags, something that hanging from the I mean, they're worried about students maybe having T-shirts or buttons that say political things. Mm. I talked to a key legal expert today mm. that mm. I won't name, my mm. source, mm. but very smart person. The university needs to check because censoring content, particularly political, if people want to put in their windows, they're for this candidate or that candidate or some issue, political speech, particularly the content, the university's got to treat differently. And just because they think it looks prettier to have nothing on the windows, they're treading in dangerous yeah. territory. Well, Joe, it was, the stuff that was up there last year was just hilarious. They had one that said in post-it notes, they take a post-it note and they <laughs> made huge letters, Trump wears cargos. It was just <laughs> hilarious. They had another one, this guy put a Trump, you know, make America great sign on his window, the guy above him said in sticky notes, this guy's a tool with an arrow. <laughs> you know, it was just great fun. Yeah, yeah, I, I just yeah. don't see the harm in it, but I guess it could go too far. Well, you know, here's the thing. It's, this is more of a debate. Uh, this is bigger than windows. Um, it, it, you know, as you said, it's about the speakers on campus and uh, do they have a right of free speech to have a, a speaker who might be controversial. But, you know, here's the problem. You've got hate speech and you've got free speech. And you know you you don't want something that's discriminatory that alienates and and is hurtful to the students to people on campus. So that's a problem. Where do you ride that line, and who decides it? Well, and the courts of the, the courts have already decided and basically said political speech is the most protected, most important free speech under this little thing called the First yeah. Amendment of the but, United States. But on States. university campuses, there have been issues, and they did have one at Ohio State before President Drake was there, about what students could put on the doors in their residence hall. So this wasn't in their room. Semi-public space. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And, and I think people said, no, no, if you're going to put up uh, swastikas or you know, uh, racist things, that's unacceptable because it's creating a hostile environment yes. for your fellow students. And students don't have the absolute right to express those kinds of feelings in a, in, in, in a living, well, of course, I mean, that's right. just say that. That's right, no, in a living situation, you don't have the right to do that. But, uh, uh, so it's not a new issue, but here what's different, it's on the outside of the, it's facing out. But still, it could create, for people yeah. who live in those facilities, it could, so, so what you really do here is you say, okay, there's certain kinds of things that 
are inappropriate. You're not that opens a can of worms. Who decides? Well, what's but, exactly. But, yeah, but, but, but hostile but, speech is hard to define sure. legally, and what one person's hostile is another person's. Yeah, I'm but, just but remember, right. but exactly. the setting here is a residence hall. So, and there are people who live in that residence hall. They are students, and so it's a little different than being in a public forum. All right. We'll see. I, we'll see if the stickers go away and the signs go away and Harambe gets memorialized anymore. <laughs> Time for Off the Record, our final parting shots. Terry Casey, you're up first. Well, yesterday, unfortunately, Columbus had its 87th murder. And at the current rate, and it's been that way for the past couple months, we're going to end up around 130 or 131 murders in Columbus. For the last 11 years, we've averaged between 95 and 100. So something's not quite right in Columbus if we end up with that many murders and the murder rate is not good in this city. Sure. You know, while our attention was appropriately focused nationally on the hurricane and the, on the, on the sadness of uh, the events in Texas, uh, a lot of things have been happening with respect to uh, Mueller's investigation. It's widening, and I think we're going to see some, some of the first results of that within the next couple of weeks. And I was going to say that one of the things that happened during this past week that no one's really talking about is President Trump's tax proposal, his tax reform plan. Um, that we're hearing a lot of the things that have been controversial in the past. They're resurfacing and coming back. So look for that to be a big issue. Okay. Also controversial, play calling of the Ohio State Buckeyes started their season with a big win, and Twitter was going crazy when the first half didn't go as planned. But remember, these are 18 and 19-year-old kids playing football and they're playing together for the first time. Yeah. So keep that in mind, Buckeye fans, and go Bucks, I guess. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. You can continue the conversation there, and you can see everything online on demand at our website, wosu.org slash C-O-T-R. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.